Time was, if you wanted to leave Earth, you needed a government ride. But that's about to change, thanks to a billionaire's dream. Space tourism. Like astronauts, tourists will need a place to depart from. Not an airport, but a spaceport. I don't think uh, this has ever been built before anywhere in the world. So where in the world do they build it? Spaceport America. <laughs> Quite the challenge. Vehicles armed, three, two, one, fire. Beam me up, Scotty. But this time, Scotty's the one beamed up. The ashes of Star Trek actor James Doohan head for the final frontier. Through the uh, area of maximum dynamic pressure on the vehicle. So do the ashes of Gordon Cooper, one of America's first pioneers in space. The widows of those two gentlemen were there and actually pressed the firing button next to me in the launch control center. After five minutes in space, the rocket returns to Earth, near the very spot where visionaries foresee a whole new way of travel. Spaceport America, the world's first spaceport built from scratch. With a launch pad for vertical takeoffs, like Scotty's reusable rocket, and a runway for planes to take you into space. It works like this. A mothership called White Knight will climb 15 kilometers, then release the spaceship. The ship will climb to 110 kilometers, where ordinary passengers will join the elite ranks of astronauts. Then it will descend for re-entry and glide home to spaceport. Spearheading the Enterprise is a man who made his name in flight here on Earth. British super entrepreneur Richard Branson. In all, Nearly half a billion dollars has been fronted for a venture out of this world. For 50 years, we've had a situation in which only astronauts could go to space. You know, less than 500 people have been to space. And Virgin Galactic is going to fly more than that in the first year of operation. We're basically these airline type operations. So basically, the way you run an airline, we can apply that to space. Because for the past 30, 40 years, we're used to the perceptions of NASA and going into space, that you need a giant government bureaucracy with armies of people to go to the moon and things like that. Spaceport's first passengers won't need a big bureaucracy, just a big wallet. Those trips to space are not cheap. Round trip fare, $200,000 for a two hour flight. But the sky high cost is expected to come down to earth. And as the market expands, so will the destinations. Including point to point suborbital space flights. So rather than going from Spaceport America straight up and back down, you would go from Spaceport America to Singapore or Spaceport America to Sweden uh, or other destinations and be able to do that in an hour or less. A revolution in travel. Spaceport is looking for the perfect place to break ground, and they think they've found it in the middle of nowhere. Virgin Galactic has set up its world headquarters here in New Mexico. And riding on the inaugural commercial flight will be Branson, Virgin's CEO. By the time Spaceport is complete, Virgin plans to launch its first trip into space. On this. Here she is. The mothership called White Knight. To carry tourists towards the heavens. By sheer coincidence, Spaceport is gearing up just as America is grounding the space shuttle. Industry filling a void left by government. Where the next frontier begins is where the last frontier ended. Here, progress took a detour. But that's exactly why Spaceport wants it. It's 40 kilometers to the nearest town. Clear land and clear skies. In Florida, tropical storms force NASA to cancel launches. But here, they can fly up to 28 days out of 30. There's another reason why we chose New Mexico. The first ever film taken of the planet Earth from space was taken from a V2. But it was so top secret at the time, nobody ever saw it. But it was here that that happened. It didn't happen in Florida, it didn't happen in Texas, it happened in New Mexico. 
This is really the birthplace of American spaceflight. Marked back home, Robert Goddard moved in 1930 from New England to New Mexico and became the father of modern rocketry. Then came Werner von Braun, the father of the Nazis' V-2 rockets. After the war, he fathered America's space program. This is where men dove from the stratosphere and monkeys soared into space. Here's what really excites Spaceport. No air traffic. The reason is their neighbor over the mountains. White Sands Missile Range, America's largest military base. No commercial traffic flies over here. This is closed to commercial traffic. The wide expanse of open country, the clear airspace, uh, the excellent weather. Where else would you build Spaceport America? Sounds like a clear runway to the future. But then the past rises up to bite them. I married in uh, 1949. Then my husband lived next door. Then he asked me to come to Ingle and cook beans, and I've been here ever since. Jane Kane controls a big chunk of land needed for Spaceport, including the very runway. And for all of Branson's billions, Jane won't budge. Four generations have worked the branch. Okay. I've ridden over all of it. I've gathered cows over all of it. This is home. This is where we raised our family. And what about the town folk? Spaceport means traffic, spaceport means noise, and spaceport means change. Born and raised here in Truth or Consequences in Sierra County. This is my home, uh, my family's home. Uh, my mom was born in a small community uh, just north of, of here. So we've, we've made our home here our entire life. The Truth or Consequences is a small town. Um, you know, it stays kind of quiet. Everything shuts down around 6 o'clock most every evening. If Spaceport comes roaring in, the town will never be the same. But in the end, economics trumps tradition. We've been a sleepy little community for a lot of years. Um, and the Spaceport offers us that one shot, a, a new promise, a new future for economic development. I'm just so excited for what's going to happen to the kids that are growing up here now to really believe space and engineering and high tech and mathematics can really be a part of their future. Truth or Consequences was named for a popular game show. Now the town is in the running to become one of two gateways to Spaceport, along with this town. Population under 1,200. That's not even two fully booked airbuses. Hatch is a farming town, reputed to produce the world's best chilies. But right now, Hatch is hot for work. Spaceport could create more than 2,000 jobs, more than the entire population of Hatch. But Spaceport won't be built, and the towns won't boom, unless a rancher changes her mind. When they first started talking Spaceport, we were sure against it. Once again, economics beats tradition. Ben uh, had some sickness, and he had a drought, and he had to sell his cows, and the Spaceport sounded a lot better to him. If they thought Jane was tough, just wait. Spaceport still has a world of hurdles to overcome. It's not easy to do what we're all doing here. And it's not going to be easy. For starters, they've designed a futuristic terminal to match their far-sighted dreams. But no one's actually built anything like it. And Spaceport's biggest asset is also its biggest drawback. Location. If this was being built in the middle of a city, it would have been quick and easy. But it's so far out that that's been the, been the big issue. Everything they'll need, they'll have to bring in, including power. They'll have to build their own electrical substation and nearly 10 kilometers of power lines. And even then, they'll sometimes be cut off. Not all phone services work out here. Matter of fact, I, I don't have cell phone service. You know, you could have three, 400 people working out here at any given time once everything gets going. Where are people going to stay? The closest town is 35 miles away. Most of our guys are coming from Albuquerque, 
and uh, it's too far of a commute uh, to do on a daily basis, so they're staying in town in hotels and campers and little apartments. It's an hour going through the, the canyon getting out here and then an hour going back in every evening, so the, your work day doesn't really end when you leave the job. During the week we live here, and uh, during the weekends we go home and see our families. <laughs> Some folks may have second thoughts about the future passing through. Just bringing what they need to pour concrete will take 12,000 truckloads. That's more trips than residents. They're asking for some alternate routes. Given where the site is, there's not a whole lot of alternate routes out here. And the streets weren't designed for construction in the first place. The road system out here is pretty narrow because it's mostly been used for livestock and I mean it's just the, the ranchers moving around out here. We will be using equipment that's by itself 12 foot wide. Uh, some of the pieces of equipment we'll be bringing in are, are even wider than that. In fact, this equipment is for building a road. Spaceport is so remote, they have to pave 20 kilometers just to reach the construction site. At a key juncture along the route, those notorious flash floods have gouged the landscape. This is called alum and draw here, and it carries a significant amount of water during the rain, the monsoon seasons. It scours pretty heavy through here, and that's the reason for the bridge. The bridge is made of mammoth precast segments, each weighing up to 60 tons. And it was a nervous ride getting them here. Between the front of the truck and the tail end of the, the load was close to 200 feet. And we had some pretty tight turns to make coming up through these canyons. With the site finally connected to the outside world, construction begins on the business end of Spaceport, the runway. Wider than a football pitch and more than three kilometers long. Long enough to handle a 747 and they'll need every inch for an out-of-this-world trip. On its return to Spaceport America, the spaceship will glide in like the space shuttle, but that's where the resemblance ends. For takeoffs, the shuttle requires more fuel, more infrastructure, and more manpower. At Spaceport, they'll use the runway for takeoffs, with the spaceship carried aloft by White Knight, far cheaper than a vertical launch like the shuttle. The runway's so long, they have to divert a country road. And so thick, it's like building one of the world's largest layer cakes. 61 centimeters of subgrade. Then 10 centimeters of asphalt. Then 35 centimeters of concrete. In all, more than 100 centimeters thick. Construction starts with excavating 60 centimeters of earth for the subgrade. Enough dirt to fill more than 200 Olympic swimming pools. Before a blade touches the earth, the past rears up again. Deeper than the layers of the runway lie the strata of history, and archaeologists have to survey every inch. Running past the site is the Camino Real, the royal road of colonial Spain stretching almost 2,000 kilometers from Mexico City to Santa Fe. Travelers traipse the highway for 300 years, and behind all the fencing lies three centuries of historic litter. When you do walk the trail and you look on the ground, it's still possible to find uh, pieces of pottery, artifacts from days gone by. In all, 1,100 hectares must be surveyed, equal to more than 800 football pitches. As wide open as this site seems, the options for the layout were narrow. If we went much further to the west, uh, we got into uh, more of the cultural resource areas that we were trying to avoid. Uh, obviously, with the power lines to the east, we couldn't go much further east. And most runways in southern New Mexico have an east-west orientation. Uh, our runway is almost directly north-south. We have the Caballo Mountains to the west, and we have the San Andres Mountains to the east. Due to the two mountain ranges that uh, surround us here, 
uh, we found that that was the orientation that allowed us to take advantage of the wind and it also best fit the terrain. Nature created ideal conditions for flying, but not for building. In winter, equipment freezes, and in summer, men broil. Windstorms can shut down the whole site, and rain can turn desert into quagmire. And it does rain here. When we have rain, we have a lot of rain. We're famous out here for having a lot of flash floods. You can receive a half an inch to an inch of rain in the nearby foothills. The water doesn't penetrate very deep into the ground. And within an hour, you can have a foot or two or more of water running through some of these arroyos. So the draws and, and everything here fill up pretty quick, and you can, you can be stuck in a bad situation if you're in the wrong place. Last week, we had uh, an inch and a half ra of rain in, in about uh, 30 minutes out here, and everything out here was impassable. This dirt gets really slick, and you don't get a lot of traction in it. And then five hours later, it's back to being dry again. On the east side of the runway, rainwater will drain off naturally. But here on the west side, water will just pool. This conduit will carry the water from west to east. But in the arid high desert, dry is the norm. The biggest challenge actually has been the water. We need water. Uh, we need a lot of water on this job. It's the vital resource because they need water for everything. To drink, to flush, to control the dust. You would think in a remote area like this that dust wasn't that big of a deal, but you know we, we have concerns with the ranchers that run cattle on this, and you notice there's not a lot of real good vegetation for the, the cattle to eat, and I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that they don't like dirt in their, their food like we are, so. Most of all, they need water for construction itself. Rule of thumb on earthwork is you use anywhere from 40 to 60 gallons per cubic yard of dirt to be able to, to achieve co the proper compaction and moisture contents. The formula for concrete is if you don't have water, you don't have concrete. So there's, w without water, you're just not going to be building anything. That, that's a 10,000 gallon water wagon. Oh. About 10 minutes to lose that load. That stuff disappears pretty quick. This pond holds enough water to fill two Olympic pools, but the crews will use that much in about a week. The water comes from a distant well. And like much of the American West, it comes with a good story. The railroad comes right adjacent to the spaceport. Today that's a freight line. It used to be a passenger line. The ranchers used to wave a large white flag and that train would come to a screeching halt to pick up one passenger to take him to Albuquerque. And the railroad watered its trains from a local well. And then it was, it was capped and somewhat forgotten about except for the ranchers in the area who have talked about this awesome producing well in an area very scarce with water. Spaceport heard about the railroad well and tracked down the owner. They not only uncorked it, they threw a test, uh, test pump down there and they got 500 gallon per minute of great quality water. It's actually the only well that we've found with sufficient supply on an hourly basis. Not only was it a high producer, but also that it uh, has excellent quality. A lot of this water you will find in the area is heavily this brackish, a salty content, which obviously is no good for concrete construction. We'd end up with a concrete run runway that would disintegrate over time. So just finding that well in itself was one challenge. The next challenge was how do you get it here, whether you truck it or whether you run it through a piping system. Running fleets of trucks back and forth would create a traffic nightmare and risk destroying the road they just built. So they pipe in the water from 10 kilometers away and store it in three ponds. If the pump breaks down, the ponds will keep them going during repairs. They can get by with less water once Spaceport is built. So they're drilling for a source on their own property. Right now we're doing a test. So this water that's coming through is a test well that we've, we've pumped and we're monitoring to see what kind of ground loss we get for the locals so that we're not interfering with their consumption of water. Uh, we don't want to run them dry, otherwise we find out that the well isn't uh, going to be able to supply the project.
As spaceport rises, the water table will indeed fall. Contractors will have to truck water to ranches before the table finally recovers. Water remains a headache. We came out this morning and, uh, and found the tires down on, the, on, on one of our water wagons, so we're only operating on one, and so everything that that one is doing is all now devoted to dust control today. The culprit may be a construction hazard unique to this part of America, mesquite thorns, five centimeters long and sharp as a tack. It's a $6,000 setback, the cost of one tire, and half a day to fix. With the wind picking up, they use even more water, but they're tapping the ponds to the max. This is uh, a touchy situation. Right now we have an issue with our, with our water supply. We have subcontracted the water supply with another contractor on the job that has another section. I just yesterday found out that they don't have the water rights necessary to pump the water that they're providing us right now. So uh, we, we have an issue and, and I may have to go to another source for water. But we're uh, between a rock and a hard place. We're gonna work through the end of the day and, uh, and we're gonna shut down our operations uh, a day early. It is a dire situation. I mean, this could delay the project if we don't get the water situation straightened out out here. And water won't be their only headache. Spaceport America enters its sixth month of development. They've managed to secure rights to the water, so crucial to construction. On the runway, crews have built the subgrade and begun pouring the next layer, 10 centimeters of asphalt. After the asphalt comes the final layer, concrete. So what happened to all the dirt they dug up? It's put to good use, forming the foundation for the human side of Spaceport. The terminal hangar facility, to house the staff, the guests, and the spacecraft. The dirt is mixed with sand to form a hard subgrade for the hangar. In flat terrain, even a three-story building will tower over the landscape. As with any new high-rise, some neighbors object to the view. 11 indigenous tribes have ties to the land, and they worry that a vista centuries old will be ruined. The architects responded with an ingenious solution, blending in. Now you see it, now you don't. Even on the exposed side, the roof line undulates like the mountains to further blend in. Spaceport's three-story terminal is starting to rise. These towers form wells for the stairs and elevators, but they serve an even bigger role, holding up the mammoth roof the architects designed. This is the core of the structure, absolutely. At Spaceport America, Mike Bradley is in charge of building a terminal like no other. Towers of Spaceport's mammoth hangar rise step by step. Crews pour concrete into each frame, then move to the next level, unless nature interferes. The, the, the crane shut down automatically at 30 miles an hour. We've had instances in the last uh, several weeks of 45 up to 60 mile an hour gusts and winds. So we've had to work off hours, evenings, early mornings, uh, whatever we can possibly do to maintain schedule.
Meanwhile, other structures make headway. A plant to treat wastewater. And a huge tank to hold water. Fed finally by their own source. We have an entire well field that is being developed for Spaceport America. And those wells will supply the terminal hangar facility with domestic water directly. The water is partly for plumbing and partly for safety. Where there's fuel, there could be fire, and five million liters will be ready. And here's the firehouse, made from a giant balloon. The foundation is a ring beam that surrounds the structure. Above, they attach a huge polyvinyl membrane, barely three millimeters thick. Then, they turn on the inflators. In half an hour, they had a shell of a building. To make the shell rigid, polyurethane foam was sprayed onto the membrane. Then rebar was attached to form a foundation for the concrete, just like on the runway. But you don't see concrete applied like this every day. They're spraying concrete, a time and money saving method called shockcreting. Only a handful of companies in the world make buildings like this. So this may be the first inflated firehouse on earth. In a project like this, you can't just uh, start spraying shotcrete from the top to the bottom. It's a slow process. You have to start building in a quarter inch at a time. Right now, we have about a six to eight inch base, all the way up to about a one inch uh, layer of shotcrete up to the top or the center of the shell. Once we get through that process, we'll be able to continue to build out and build out until we hit our full depth. Layer by layer, the shell gains strength. Once we hit our full depth, we'll begin, to, we'll begin to open the openings, cut everything out, and the building will, at that point, take its true shape and true form of what it's supposed to look like. Like this sample. These buildings are phenomenal when it comes to acoustics. You can actually stand at one point of the dome, no matter how big the dome is. If there's somebody on the other side, he'll be able to hear you clear as day. The word Spaceport's dreads hearing is fire. But fire engines will be standing here just in case. Even as construction continues, one client is already operating out of Spaceport. There's not a lot of companies that, that uh, launch rockets for a living. Up Aerospace carries cargo, not people. Right now our rockets are small. They're called suborbital rockets. They go into space, but they only stay there for about five minutes. Uh, our main goal is to get to an orbital vehicle, and that is one that puts a satellite into orbit that stays in space and encircles the globe. And they have a big client waiting in the wings. Due to modern technology, we are moving to smaller and smaller satellites. And the Air Force is interested in this sort of uh, access to space. This is where we could bring our satellites to put on launch vehicles to fly out of Spaceport America. After two months, the terminal's taking shape. The stairwells that support the entire structure are complete. The next step on the level we're standing on is to pour the concrete deck so we can work at the level below and above us. We'll follow that with the uh, roof trusses starting at the north working to the south. We've got two piece trusses that are each 190 feet long, need to be joined in the middle. That'll be the most uh, critical part of the job. The working end of Spaceport, the runway, is ready. But the rest of Spaceport is still racing towards the finish line. One year since construction began, and what a difference. But some things never change. It's very hot out here. As you can see, it's very hot. <laughs> Let's get to 100 this weekend, from what I understand. It's brutal out here when it's hot. In the firehouse, they're cutting bays for the trunks. Like the hangar, this building towers above the terrain. From the center shell to the top of the highest point of the dome, it's about 32 feet. But like the hangar, it'll blend in. 
At the terminal, one man shoulders a heavy burden, the roof line. This is probably the most complicated project I've ever been on and the most uh, amazing. I don't think uh, this particular design has ever been built before anywhere in the world, so it's uh, quite the challenge. This is a uh, mock-up of the upper roof on the spaceport. We have a stainless steel bullnose that goes completely around the uh, border of the building. It's like a great big pie, if you will, and it goes around on a radius, so every part is cut on that radius angle. And the two sides are mirror images of each other. It's very complicated because the roof actually goes up and down, and this metal, as you know, doesn't bend very easily. So these parts are actually made to fit those bends. So they'll all come out numbered. It'll be like a puzzle that you put together. A jumble of prefab puzzle parts will make up the entire roof. Some parts have less than three millimeters of wiggle room. So Mark has to ensure they'll fit. And this one doesn't. It should get smaller as it goes toward the building. This is the outside of the building. This will be going in toward, you know, the window and the inside of the building. And they need to be tapered to get that pie shape. And we'll work that out with uh, the metal company before they actually start sending parts out. So we aren't delayed when the project begins. Just get the bugs out. I can't wait to get started. I got to get this mock-up done first, though. Pressure's always on in construction. The start date can change and get later, but the end date never changes. The more flesh they put on the hangar, the more it will blend in. This is the side that will greet the passengers, arriving by shuttle bus to keep traffic to a minimum. They'll enter what looks like a trench in the earth. Uh, all the exterior colors are a pre-finished uh, rust color, if you will, to match the desert floor. So yeah, it'll all blend in pretty well here. Keeping a low profile respects the wishes of neighbors. But hidden within the eye-pleasing form is a practical function. Beneath the earthen mounds will lie these concrete tubes, helping to heat and cool the building entirely naturally. The tubes will be buried in constantly temperate soil, so as outside air flows into the building, it's cooled in the summer and warmed in the winter. One more way that spaceport rests lightly on the land. Last year of construction. The road to get here is complete. The firehouse just needs finishing touches. And flesh appears on the terminal skeleton. We're on the third floor west elevation right now, which is basically the main entryway of the building. Portable heaters in here so we can continue working through the winter. Throughout, they're installing a labyrinth of arteries. We've got several different types of sprinkler systems. Probably has one of the most complex uh, HVAC systems I've ever seen. We've got radiant heat tubing out there to install because there's no forced air heating out there. It's all radiant from the bottom. You can see behind me the glass and glazing is going in. The door tracks are installed. Doors will be installing next week. On these rails, we'll ride the mammoth hangar doors. The face of the door frame will cover with quarter inch steel. Uh, and again, it'll be the brown to match the uh, desert floor. And they're finishing the room with a view. Outside, Spaceport is designed to blend into its surroundings. And in this room, the outside 
comes in. This is the brains of the uh, entire flight. We'll begin right here. Mission control from start to stop. Complete view of the runway from end to end. You will enter from the west side, cross over into the third floor reception area where you'll be uh, trained for your experience. That experience will change flight as we know it. We're still building aluminium tubes that we were building in the 1940s and 50s to get people around this planet. Spaceport will usher in not just new types of vehicles, but new kinds of passengers. Remember, no experience necessary and no supermen required. In time, they hope to move from up and down flights to orbital tours, the space equivalent of a pleasure cruise. A 21st century vacation with cosmic snapshots to bring home to the skeptics. When the airplane was first invented and started flying, people thought that was just crazy. And what good would it possibly do? A lot of people scoffed at that as just a stunt. And that's what's happening here. Um, the space tourism is not a stunt. Spaceport enters the home stretch. The hangar now glows with a glass facade, custom made in Germany. One of the most eye-popping sights you'll find on any runway. Mark has worked out all the kinks of the most complex component, the bullnose roofline. Now they can start installing its jigsaw puzzle of parts. Everything starts from right there. There's the exact center of the building. And so this building is symmetrical, so both sides are exactly the same. The bull nose goes on first, that piece, and then, then everything goes together from there. Every one of these panels is custom made, so if something happens to one of the panels or if a panel is made wrong, you can't proceed any, any longer because it's all put together. You get, to get to that panel, you'd have to take everything apart to get to it. The more Spaceport stands out on one side, the more it blends in on the other. When we showed up and uh, started the project and we were going to build this, this spaceport thing, it, it, it's kind of neat, uh, but you're standing in the middle of a mesa with nothing but jackrabbits and mesquite. And at first we just thought spaceport, well, you know, pie in the sky. Now that we're seeing it actually come together, I, I get even more excited about what's taking place here. It's tough to not develop an emotional bond with, with what you're building. <laughs> It'll be a little sad to leave it, leave it and have to go somewhere else. I'm looking forward to coming back years later and show my kids what we did. This is a chance to be part of history. You know, this is the Wright Brothers type of chance. And when the Wright Brothers built that first aircraft, how would they think that there's going to be runways in every major city? This is the next step, the next level. And, and this is the first one of many to come, I believe. Are you ready for Spaceport America? It's the future, and it's kind of nice to be a part of the future. We investigate mob history's most enduring whodunit in Valentine's Day Massacre on Wednesday at 9. Stay tuned for a harrowing banged-up abroad.